just want to say in response to uh, Aubrey and, and Laura, uh, I, I share everything and every sentiment they made. And I'm quoting Bill Gates here, who said that we are underestimating what we can achieve in two years. Where's Laura? That's, your, that's her two years. And, and uh, we are... Uh, sorry, we are overestimating. I see that we are overestimating what we can achieve in two years, but we are underestimating what we can achieve in ten years. And I think Aubrey is right. I think in the next few years it's going to be we are catching a wave now. Um, and I will point out to event that I think will happen in five years that will really cause the tsunami in a very good way. But let me take you first into. Uh, it, 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 so you can understand my life. And, and I'll tell you this story about an uh, old gentleman, a hundred-year-old gentleman that walks into Arch Insurance. Is this is the biggest uh, company in uh, London? W walking to a, a life insurance company and wants life insurance. And the clerk looks at him and says, <laughs> we don't give life insurance to hundred years old. He said, that's not true because my mother is insured here. He said, how old is your mother? He said, she's 120 years old. Is she healthy? Yeah, she's fine. So the clerk thinks better. He goes to talk with the boss, and they realize that there's a marketing opportunity, and they come to the older gentleman, and they said, you know what? Come on Tuesday. The papers will be ready. You'll sign them. You'll have your life insurance. And the elderly gentleman says, I'm sorry, I'm busy on Tuesday. They said, what do you have, old man, in, on Tuesday? He said, it happens that on Tuesday, my grandfather is getting married. <laughs> How old is your grandfather? He said he's 150. He's 150 and he wants to get married. He said he doesn't want to, but his parents put lots of pressure. <laughs> okay, and, and I think I'm, I'm told that's my life, but I think Aubrey and Laura and, and everybody else here are thinking the same way. So how, how do we do that? Um, so uh, just as a conflict, I want to I show that I'm a, a founder a, and a board member of a, of a public uh, company, Cobra, that is in the field of aging, and I'm also a founder of this venture capital called Life Bioscience. I'm not going to talk anything about them. I just want to, uh, again, tell you that we at the field are moving our uh, intellectual properties into a uh, to industry. These things are happening and it's really exciting because we went from hope to promise. We just need to realize the promise now. So those small circles are kind of what many of you will, will experience when you get uh, old. And as Aubrey said, for us, it's about, biologically, it's about those um, eight hallmarks of aging. And you can take a picture and you can study them because I'm not going to go over each one of them, maybe some of them. But the major point is that those are interconnected. And they're interconnected in a way that you can fix any one of them and influence the other. And we have examples of that. You can improve the a garbage disposal of uh, proteins and, and turn it into a, a, a clean energy, and you're going to affect not only the proteostasis, but you're going to affect the mitochondria and the metabolism. We are trying, in my center, um, uh, we are trying to study each one of those hallmarks, and, and maybe add hallmarks or, or, or solve the hallmark. Um, and so the investors should think about each part of the hallmark, but the future will be when are we targeting at what age and with what combination, and the drugs will get better and better. What we've done so great in our field is we didn't only see what aging is looks like, but we tried to figure out how we can make animals live longer. And by studying longevity, we didn't discover everything we need to do to know about aging, but we got pretty good ideas of some of the things that, that uh, we could do. 
And I would summarize decades of work in the next two sentences. First of all, health span, okay, and this is in red, health span and lifespan has been uh, uh, improved in many, many uh, animal models. And I just want to make a point here. When I started my research, I talked about aging, and I understood that this is a losing word. <laughs> Uh, and since I'm looking at longevity, I started using the term longevity, only to realize that the public intuitively, wrongly, but intuitively think that we're talking about them getting sick and living longer with their sickness. In their head, they don't understand that we're talking about something else, which is health span which is what I'm using more, and I, I advise for people when it comes to the public to use it more. And, and in fact, I would say, you know, when we have the drug that will improve health span, the television advertisement will say, you know, this drug will improve your health span. And the side effects will include longevity, you know, maybe we'll apologize. Maybe you're not ready, you're not ready economically, but I think health span is a very important uh, uh, word. And so every time that we uh, are having a drug that increases uh, lifespan, we also want to make sure that it increases health span. And the second thing is that, yes, there are drugs, uh, as the last example, there are drugs that uh, can be repurposed that are all already hitting in the biology of aging, uh, I'll talk about metformin uh, soon, but rapamycin is an example of a drug that you give to any animal, they live longer, they live healthier, and there's data in humans to suggest that this is going to be uh, the same. Uh, so I'm going to talk for the rest of the time on three challenges that are things that we have to solve in the next few years in order for all those biotechs to be bought, <laughs> okay? in a very high uh, valuation. The first challenge that we have is that, you know, uh, I, I look at the audience, I have no idea who of you has hypertension or high cholesterol uh, or diabetes, but I can pretty much know who's above 50 and, and below 50. So aging has a, a biology, right? And we know that this biology can be targeted and that this biology drives uh, diseases. But there is another issue. There is a difference. So how do, we, how, do we get, how do we get the phenotype like hypertension, like diabetes, like hypertension? What we need to do is to distinct between biological age and chronological age. You see those people there are the same age, but those in the upper case are playing golf and those uh, that are in the lower, same age, but they need uh, assistance in walking. So why some people are aging slower and some people are aging faster and how we can learn enough from that in order to uh, see if it's related to any of those models, any of those hallmarks and develop drug and can test them in the context of slow and rapid aging. The second problem is unlike cholesterol and blood pressure, we don't have biomarkers for aging. And that's a problem because now we have to do a study that will have outcomes like heart disease or, or uh, Alzheimer's or cancer, and it takes years to do that. And we might not do it at the end. How can we have a biomarker that will predict very soon that we are actually targeting aging? So that's the second point. And then the graph suggests to, to, uh, to suggest a biomarker that will distinguish between this chronological and biological age, but more important, that it will change when we give treatment. And, and that's really the, the, really the best biomarkers are not to distinguish between age, but to change when we are treating aging. And the third thing is the major problem that will hold us uh, before we reach success. And that is that targeting aging is not an FDA uh, indication. It's not indication to any 
of the regulatory forces around the world. And what that means is that even if we have the drugs, the healthcare providers don't need to pay for it. And if the healthcare providers are not paying for that, then the pharmaceuticals are not jumping in in order to get our biotechs and do the phase three trials and start making an impact. The pharmaceuticals, most of them are interested, they are looking at us, they are inviting us to talk, but they are on the fence, they are not trying operatively anything to get ready for us. How do we change that? So those are the three things that I'll, 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 I'll talk about briefly. So I have 700 centenarians in a study. Those are four people that were born between 1910 and 1920. They are the only siblings of, two, uh, of children of two parents. And the important thing about them, they each live to be over age 102. Um, the person who's standing on the right, Helen, lived to be 110. And I met her when she was 100 years old. And she greeted me smoking. <laughs> and I said, none of your doctors told you to stop smoking? And she said, the four doctors that told me to stop smoking, they died. <laughs> Actually, what's important with our centenarians is that they didn't interact with the environment. They had genetic uh, mutations that allowed them to live that long, and that's what we are really looking for. Uh, the brother who sits with the gun, he died at 109. He, was a, a, he had a hedge fund, and he was part of this hedge fund until his last days. Um, when he, he, he was said, what, what happens if, if we sell your hedge fund? He said, I'll buy it back because he, he didn't want to be out of work. So the point is, you can be healthy at age 110. We know that, okay? We have a capacity to live maybe 115 years as a species, something like that. Uh, we can live healthy much longer. And in fact, the major thing I want to show you is we really wanted to know if those guys are living longer, okay, are they getting sick when everybody gets sick and then they live longer or are they healthy longer? And there is the answer. Um, so those are two studies, this New England Centenarian study. Those are the two US studies, the New England Centenarian studies and our studies. And let, let's look at our study, the LGP, the Longevity Gene Project. And in the green is our control. And in the blue is our centenarians. And what we are watching falling is how many of them are getting diseases as they get old. And the diseases are up there. And you see that the people who are the control group that don't have longevity, at age 80, only 10% of them do not have a disease. But you can also see that in our centenarians, when they're over the age of 100, 30% of them don't have a, a, a disease. And it, it really shows you that it's not only that they uh, lived longer, but they lived healthier. But this is really not the major point. The major point is that they had a contraction of morbidity. At the end of their lives, they died very uh, rapidly. They were sick on average five months, not like us that are sick five to eight years at the end of, of our lives. And Independently, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, that is looking at, at lots of health parameter, and this is starting in 93, same data today. The medical cost in the last two years of life of somebody who dies over the age of 100 is third of those who dies uh, at the age of 70. And, and that's part of what we call the longevity dividend that was, uh, that was mentioned before. And the longevity dividend is expected to be $7 trillion by the year 2030 without, by the way, unlike the movie, without increasing, at least not significantly, age of retirement, which should, should be done um, uh, anyhow. But the longevity dividend is huge. And 
And I think that's the way to approach politicians. We have to tell them it's not that the individual wants to live healthier. You should want them to live healthier because there's a huge cost saving. And there needs to be other social adaptation, as, as you guys said before and show later. And we, we uh, developed several drugs that are already past a uh, phase three trial. And not we, uh, we, uh, uh, Merck and Ionis have developed drug based on our, our genetic finding. But I want really to exemplify one of our findings because, and, and I chose that in a respect of a, Tina and Pamola and some of the other women who are towering uh, above me, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that the growth hormone pathway should be decreasing aging, but I want actually to show that old peop that uh, tall people can also live longer with those mutations. So I hope that you take it this way. But in nature, the short, the dwarf lives longer. You know, the small dogs live longer, the, th the ponies live longer. When you mutate those growth hormone IGF receptor in mice, in, in nematodes, those that are dwarf live longer, those that are not live shorter. In fact, in our centenarians, what you see is the mortality curve. Uh, and by the way, after age 100, you have a 20, 30 percent uh, uh, mortality rate. But you see the green line is the women in this case who had the lowest IGF-1 level. IGF-1 level is the peripheral growth hormone. And they live twice as long as the women with a, lot, with, a, with a high IGF-1 level. And in fact, mutation in those growth hormone axes are accounting for almost 60% of our centenarians. It's really a very determinant uh, uh, kind of uh, genetics for our centenarians. So Gilad Simon came to me more than a decade ago and showed me something interesting that 12% of our centenarians have a whole deletion of the receptor of growth hormone. Exome 3 of growth hormone is totally deleted. And, and so people with this mutation seem to survive much better and, 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 and get to be centenarians. And so I asked him, so what is the level of those growth hormones in, in the subject? And he said, it's lower. And I said, it's very good. So how tall are they? And he said, that's a real problem. They are much taller than the others. And I said, come on, I, w what kind of story am I going to say? How, how is it possible that they have such a severe mutation and they have low IGF-1 level, but they are taller? So he said, what to do? I said, well, first go and validate it. Let's see if it's really happening, and then we'll worry about that. So he validated in four other groups, and in each one of those groups, those that, those that lived longer had much more of those mutations in this growth hormone, uh, the deletion in exome 3 of this growth hormone. So we had to figure out the mechanism. And I won't tell you the studies we've done, but we discovered something really interesting, that when there's no growth hormone, and we tested it on the cells of those subjects, when there are no growth hormone, when there's no growth hormone activation, their IGF-1 level, their peripheral growth hormone is really low, like we measured. But when we incubated with growth hormone, it's the opposite. Their, their activation of the receptor and the proliferation by growth hormone is increase. So what's really happening is that during puberty, when growth hormone is high, somehow this receptor is hyperactivation, so they get very tall. But without growth hormone that happens after puberty, it goes down and, and then it's not activated. So just a private example, one of the examples to show people who are tall and are worried about me talking about the growth hormone that you can be tall and have, lo and have longevity. Uh, what do we do with uh, discoveries like that? Okay, how do we go from people and design a drug? Well, actually a drug was designed by Amgen and by other pharmaceutical. There is a drug that was designed for cancer to block IGF receptor that is highly expressing cancer. And as it happened, cancers are smarter. The drugs failed. But the, dr but the drug was in human use. 
What we ask Amgen is to supply the murin antibody, the, the, the rodent antibody. And we did a study where we gave this antibody starting at about 20 months, 20, 22 months, so that's like 70 years old. And when we gave it, what you see in red is that those animals that got it lived longer. But it's only that, not only that they live longer, there's variety of things that improved. By the way, I cannot see what I'm writing here, so you have to read that. <laughs> A variety of, of uh, health points that are uh, improved. But I want also to make another point. It's never too late, really, to target aging. And I, I think we have to make sure that elderly knows that. It may be not as much as an effect, but if aging has a biology and this biology is continuous, it's never really too late to uh, target that. Okay. So this is... a. Um, uh, so, so this is so. So, what I told you so far is uh, really how do how do we distinguish between uh, people uh, b between biological aging and and, chrono and chronological aging? One way is to take those centenarians. In fact, we have a study where we have the children of centenarians. You'll see in a second, and they are much healthier than our control population. So now it's the biomarkers. And what I'm describing here is we did proteomics, which means we measured 5,000 protein. We is, in a, is a, a new technology, a technology that's called SOMAMER. So we measured 5,000 proteins on 1,000 uh, people between the age 65 and 95, and we asked basically what... What changes between those years? What is reflecting aging in, in the proteome of the plasma? Nobody have looked at more than few proteins at a time, okay? So this is a huge opportunity. And in order to see what's happening, we do what's called a volcano plot. In fact, I think, I think it's exactly what happened here. Let's say, let's say that we have here a lava uh, and, and, and we have all this data and I want uh, it to throw as high and far as possible those hot lava stones, you're on red seats, okay? And the higher it goes up there is more significant. It's 10 to the minus 80, so you're significant, okay? And the farther it goes, the more effective it is. And what you see that there's a ton of proteins that are very significantly increased or, or some of them are decreased with aging. And the interesting thing is we've never known them before. We never thought of them as before. before. So what are those proteins? Well, some of those proteins are actually mechanistically important. For, for example, number one cluster of proteins are those with the growth hormone IGF pathway. Uh, but those protein, those protein, a lot of them, those in red are, are all what Aubrey described, those are damage. Those are proteins that are uh, showing damage of collagen, of fibrin, degranulation of white blood cells, of platelets. It's a breakdown. And at first I thought, oh, God, I wanted to know something more interesting. But eventually I became to realize, really, that those are really very important because no matter how we treat aging, we're going to stop the breakdown. No matter what hallmark we're going to hit, we're going to stop the breakdown. So are they really relevant for this distinguish between biological and chronological age. What do we know about them? Well, I told you there are 1,000 people, but 500 of them were what we call controlled. They don't have longevity in the family, and 500 of them do have longevity in the family. And you can see with your eyes that those with longevity in the family are more pink. Okay, they have less proteins that are significantly high. Why? Because they age a little bit slower. And this shows you better. Let's see if I can share that. So 
only 206 proteins are changed in the offspring of centenarians, and over 500 are changed, or, th or 400 more are changed in control. Okay, so they have much less significant. But there is something even better that happens. In those offspring of centenarians, we have 29 proteins that don't exist in control. And some of them, we know, are actually protective protein, like CLOTO, like VCAM, like sperm protein 17. So we have also a, a, a chance to discover things that might go, be good uh, to longevity with these proteins, but you could certainly appreciate that it distinct between people with different uh, biological and chronological aging. And so we are trying to do this clock, this clock that will tell you what's the difference between your biological age and chronological age. So this guy, for example, he's actually 90 years old. Uh, sorry, he, yeah, he's 90 years old, but he, he looks like 110 years old, and he died two months later. But really, what, is, what are those people and those people? And uh, the prediction of their mortality is what we're trying to do, and I'll, I'll tell you, as this shows, that this biological aging predicts mortality much better than chronological age or even frailty. So this, this kind of things, and that's not the only, um, by the way, biomarkers, there's methylation biomarkers, there are other biomarkers, but I think the biomarkers are going to be out there very soon, and they're going to be very important for us so that we can, in a short time, see if our drugs are, are working. And lastly, I, I want to talk about uh, this uh, trial that's called Targeting Aging uh, with Metformin. And just that you know, metformin is used for type 2 diabetes. The first to use it is actually the UK. It's in use for, I think, 65 years here. It's now generic. It's very cheap. It's one of the cheapest, it's the cheapest drug in the UK, United States market. Uh, it's safe because we know what it's doing for 60 years. There were many trials with that. Uh, and, and metformin for us is just a tool to target aging. And I have to explain why I mean it's a tool. Because it's not only about proving the concept that aging can be delayed. Okay, I wouldn't lead this study because of that. It's because this was an opportunity for scientists to go to the FDA and say, look, we want to repurpose a drug. Which drug? Metformin. You have everything you need to do in metformin. Go and look at metformin. We didn't have to talk about it. But we want to talk with you about two things. First of all, we want to talk to you about indication. What are we treating here? How do we call it? And second, we just want to make sure that we're doing the trial and you're not going to tell us you should have done something else. So this is our trial. Tell us what you suggest. The first part was interesting because neither us scientists, not the FDA, not the AARP, the retirement organization, not the American Federation of Aging Research, want to call aging a disease. There's ageism out there. Older people are fired. They're not hired. Now you call them sick. And not everybody is sick. Okay? We found out that we don't need to call names. What we're do going to do is we're going to prevent a, a cluster of age-related diseases. We're going to show that the cluster of age-related diseases is moving. You get them later. Okay? Uh, the FDA says, you, <laughs> you want to say that you target aging? You can say that you target aging. We don't care what you do. If you prevent those diseases, that's okay. A as far as the study, they gave us uh, some interesting advice, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip it now. So... Uh, what do we have, b beside the fact that when we give it to a variety of animals, they live longer, there's a whole body of evidence that suggests that metformin targets aging. So in non-diabetic, it will prevent diabetes. It's have a 30% effect over four years. In a UK PDS study, one of the biggest studies on diabetes here in the UK, only metformin prevented cardiovascular diseases 
in diabetic patients, also an effect of 30%. There are other studies like that. There are hundreds of studies that shows that all kinds of cancers are prevented by metformin. And it's interesting, when we, a bunch of scientists, went to the NCI, to the National Cancer Institute, they said, no, 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 every cancer is its own disease. And this is the point that's hard to explain to that, but cancer is an age-related disease. When you go from zero to 80, the, the rates of cancer increase by 500-fold. It's exponential. This is the aging part. Okay, this is the aging part. That's why all cancers are involved because this is, you need this aging in order to get any one of the kinds of cancer, even though that each cancer has its own genetics and risks and, and, and all that things. There's several uh, studies, clinical, small clinical studies on, a, on MCI, on what we call early Alzheimer and Alzheimer disease that shows that people on, on uh, metformin have less, less than that. And I think that's the most beautiful study, at, and it came here. And not, not, not only it came from here, it cannot be done in the United States. Those investigators went to pharmacies and looked at individuals who started with metformin, or with a, another drug to treat diabetes that is sulfonylurea. Um, and they match them to controls that didn't have diabetes, but they were treated by the same doctors in the same pharmacies and, and adjusted for other things. There were almost 200,000 people in the studies. And their only question was over five years, what's the mortality? And you immediately see that the people who had less mortality are the people on metformin. They actually had 17% less mortality than people without diabetes. Although they had diabetes and they were obese and they were more sick to begin with, they lived longer. And of course, the people on sulfonylurea with diabetes had higher mortality because that's what we know about diabetes. So if you take together all the independent effects of metformin on Alzheimer's, on cancer, on diabetes, and on mortality, you kind of, of, of get it that it's already, already shown in humans. It just hasn't been shown on the same trial. The trial basically is to take people between 65 and 80 years old and uh, do a placebo control study. We're talking about 3,000 people where the primary endpoint, which we call the FDA endpoint, is the time to incidence of any major related diseases. And this is the cluster. There's another uh, study that's, uh, that's already funded in anticipation by the NIA to look at the biomarker part. Part of the biomarkers are going to be the proteomics. They were in, a, a, I, I should say something about the proteomics. If, if, you're, if you're not impressed, I want to say just one thing. It's published this month in Nature Medicine, which is the highest impact factor in the thing. So I, I want you to understand, I'm not showing off, I'm just telling you it's important, okay? So we'll have biomarkers that will show if they are changing or not and will develop, help develop this field uh, much faster. We, we are the, this is a nonprofit uh, um, effort. American Federation of Aging Research is raising the money for this study. The pharmaceuticals don't want to help here. They want, it, they want it to be done. They don't want to help. And it's been really, those are the, also my two years. The last two years were very frustrating to get the funding going, and we hope to start it in January. We do miss about $10 million out of the $50 million, and we hope to, we cannot recruit the patient without telling him that we have enough money to end the study. So we need to recruit this money, and as, as soon as the money is there, we're starting this study all over the United States. So. I talked about the fact that there is longevity dividend, and we have, we have to make the politicians understand that, that biological and chronological age is an opportunity for us to discover what's important in human, that biomarkers are important so that we can predict the success of treatment 
and that regulation will uh, pave the road for, uh, for future success. I want to end with one point here. Look, we can take a sperm of a 70-year-old man, and we can measure the age of the sperm <laughs> with methylation and maybe by other methods. And we can take an egg of a 50-year-old woman, okay, and fertilize them. And then the blastocyte is formed, okay? Basically, the baby is formed. And the age of the baby starts at zero, okay? This blastocyte doesn't have memory for the age of the parent. We start like that. We figured out how to do it in our body for this case. We'll figure out how to do it for the future. Uh, health spent to you all, and I'll be happy to be around and answer. <laughs>